let's move on to the last paper that we are going to cover on unconditional GANs. This is actually trying to look at the images generated by a style GAN and then try to increase their quality and fix some problems. Uh, imagine this, you are working at a large company, you have a manager, uh, which is not going to have the type of skills that you have. They have different types of skills like people management. You show them some generated images out of perhaps one year of hard work. And then they're going to say, these images are not yet ready. They don't look good. There is some minor details or minor mistakes in the images. Go and fix them because our consumers are going to be unhappy. And then you're going to go ahead and work on that topic again. Try to improve the generated images. That's the idea here. We are trying to be perfectionists. It's a 22 paper, so it's very recent. You have input latent code, and this is exactly what the style GAN was doing. You would take a normal random variable or random number generated from normal distribution. You push it through a mapping function. We just saw its architecture, which is just a fully connected network. And then that's going to give you a W that's going to look really complex. So don't think of W as the weights of any neural networks. It is just coming out of uh, F. So you can think of it being the same as, as the same functionality as Z. It's just a latent variable. And then we would take W, push it through affine transformations, and those were giving us the styles that we were using in uh, adaptive instance normalization to modify the style of the image. And then you have your synthesis network that not only was taking as input these styles, but was also taking as input those noise variables. And this is the synthesis network. So I'm removing F, which is just a boring, fully connected deep neural network. And uh, Ws are going to go through this affine transformation to give you the styles. Noises are going to go through a simple multiplication by a bias, not a bias, by a scale, and then they're going to get injected. And then you have progressive growing ideas. And we know how to train a neural network in a progressive growing fashion. We covered it. You do that, and then you're going to see, you're going to show the generated images to your manager, and your manager is going to look at those images and it's going to notice some blob shaped artifacts in the generated images. So these are in the shape of water droplets. And then you go ahead and work on the details of your neural network. You, pay, you play around with adaptive instance normalization and you figure out that something is wrong with adaptive instance normalization. This could be the root cause of these blob shaped artifacts. And then there are some other artifacts and the root cause of them is going to be progressive growing, like these ones. Uh, when the face is front-facing, the teeth is also front-facing. When the pose of the face changes and it's no longer front-facing, the teeth is still front-facing. And these are definitely uh, not nice artifacts to have. Why is it because of progressive growing? Because once you are at lower resolution, you are picking up the bigger details of your image. And they're going to stick with your generation process throughout the training up until uh, the last resolution that you're training. So by the time that you're looking at low resolution images, there is no teeth. And even if they show up, it's going to be uh, bigger or, uh, or these are not going to be details. These are going to be just the big picture of the teeth. You are not going to be seeing all these details. And those, uh, the things that your neural network is learning at low resolutions is going to stick with it. And it's going to be really hard to get rid of them throughout training the later layers. So these are the artifacts that you're going to see. Let's uh, modify ADAIN. And to modify ADAIN, you're going to have a modulation demodulation process. So this modulation demodulation is going to replace ADAIN. You still have those affine transformations. You still have Ws. These Ws are not weights. These are coming out of your latent code. So I keep emphasizing them because it is important. They're coming out of here. These are affine transformations. 
modulation, demodulation, convolution, and these are, this is the first layer is a constant, trainable constant, and then the last, the next layers are from the previous layers, the outputs of the previous layers. This is your bias. So what you're doing is adding the bias after doing your convolution. This is different from adding. You were in adding, you were adding the bias, you were multiplying by the scale, and then you would push your outcome through your convolution. So this is different. Don't worry about this math yet. What are we doing? You have, you're gonna have three versions of your W. It's gonna be W, which is the original W coming out of your deep neural network. This is the intermediate latent code. You're gonna have W prime, which is gonna be the modulated version of W out of this operation. And then you're gonna have the demodulated version. You're gonna have the scale, which is gonna come out of this affine transformation. This is basically your style. And if you remember, you had a vector the same size as the number of channels. And I is gonna count the input feature map. J is gonna count the output feature map. And K is gonna enumerate the spatial footprint of a convolution. And you can think of K as if you are uh, collapsing the X coordinate and Y coordinate of your pixel locations in a single in a single dimension. So now basically you're counting your pixels, one, two, three, four, five. And even if you go to the next route, next round, it's gonna be 11, 12, 13, 14, etc. So K is counting your pixels, J is counting channels, output channels, I is counting or indexing input channels, S is coming out of this operation. And this is where you're actually gonna inject a style. And then I can now explain modulation. You take W, multiply it by S. You scale it up or down with your style. And then immediately you divide by the norm of your result plus some epsilon. And this is demodulation. So this is no longer your standard deviation. This is basically the norm over the input and uh, the pixel locations. And then you demodulate. And then you're gonna have a bias of its own for later layers. So you are no longer subtracting the mean dividing by the standard deviation. You scale up or down and then divide by the norm. The norm is a single value because you are averaging out over i and k or you're summing over i and k. It means that you are, have a single number per each channel. So you're gonna do per channel scaling up or down and then you're dividing by the entire norm of the thing over i and k and that's demodulation. What else? There is also no need for progressive growing if you have skip connections all over the place at every single resolution, and then you can get rid of progressive growing. At lower resolution, you turn them into red, green, blue. You keep them. At higher resolution, you turn into red, green, blue, and do a simple addition with the upsampled version of the previous layer. And then you have this shortcut, shortcut connection everywhere. And if your network decides to go through this route, it's gonna decide on its own. It's gonna take the shortcuts. We are not forcing it to take the shortcuts. And this is different from what you are doing with progressive growing. You do the same thing with your upsampling and your decoder or your discriminator, which is gonna go from higher resolution to lower resolution. And you always have this shortcut connection. Okay, perfect. We got rid of progressive growing. We got rid of adaptive instance normalization. There is also one regularization technique. It's good to know. Uh, don't worry about J, Y, A, W yet, but the rest of it is just square parentheses, norm two, and these are expectation operations. And don't worry about the name yet, path, length, regularization. Why is it a regularization? Where is J coming from? It is coming out of the Jacobian of your generator or your synthesis network, which is now modified to have this version. What are you computing that Jacobian with respect to? Are you taking this constant and taking derivative with respect to that constant? Or are you taking derivatives with something else? No, you're taking derivatives with respect to your intermediate latent code. What is your Y? You're just, you just keep sampling from normal distribution with identity. And your W is coming out of your 
fully connected part of your network. It's just your intermediate latent code. What is A? A is the average of these uh, norms. So it's just going to end up being a scalar. The Jacobian times y is going to give you a vector. This norm 2 is going to give you a scalar. And then it's as if you are subtracting a baseline from it. And this is going to correspond to path length. What do I mean? This term, expectation with respect to w, expectation with respect to y of this squared parenthesis term is going to get minimized when your Jacobian is actually orthogonal. It means that the derivative of g with respect to w's is orthogonal. Why is it useful? Because it's going to end up, if it is orthogonal, it's going to preserve length. If two points are, let's say, uh, L apart in the previous layer, they're going to end up being L apart in the outputs. So you're preserving length. So you're preserving distances. Why is it useful? Because it's not going to introduce any squeezing along any dimension. So suddenly your neural network is not going to collapse into a single number for some dimensions. That's the regularization term. In the end, in terms of quantitative metrics, you're going to look at fresh inception distance or inception score. Weight demodulation, path length, regularization is what we just explained here. No progressive growing, which is using this architecture. All of them are helping. At the same time, larger neural networks help. So you're just going to scale up your neural network. Why is that important? Why is scaling important? Let's take a look at the variance of the generated images. These are relative variances at different resolution. That's your Y coordinate or Y axis here. The X axis is the training process. This is the smaller version of the model. These are the relative variances in the generated images. So these are the relative variations in your uh, images coming out of low resolution. As the training progresses, you are going to see more and more of your high resolution stuff. It means that your high resolution stuff is going to contribute more. This is for the smaller size network. If you increase the size of your network, you are going to see more and more of those high resolution variances. That's why having a larger network helps. And this fact that as you uh, keep training, your neural network first focuses on low resolution and then high resolution, it is exactly what we were hard coding in a progressive growing gap. We were first focusing on low resolution, then higher resolution. This architecture is going to do that on its own. Okay, so this is one of the uh, best uh, image generations or image generation frameworks these days. I think I'm gonna stop here and let you guys ask questions. And for those of you who want to leave, you can leave.